Um, how how did you become politicised? And is there a story behind that that we don't know? I I don't really think I've told it all that much. So this should be an exclusive. A world exclusive on Nick There Talks. we go. There we go. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was always on the outskirts of political movements when I was younger, but mainly from a cultural perspective. I've always been a major comic book nerd as maybe the one of three shelves in this very tiny box room behind me may give away. And I wasn't big on political philosophy or the actual ins and outs of the parliamentary system, but I did have this intuitive sense that my hobby and interests were being perverted by outside forces who had dark designs for me. Like, one of the main things was in, in 2011, DC rebooted their entire line, restarting all their comics from number one, like it was the French Revolution year zero, including action comics, which at that point had had about 900 odd issues and, and Superman had been running since 1938. And they rebooted it not only to be dark and edgy and hip, but they overthrew some of their characters with racial and gender recasting, like, like the beloved Flash of 1990s, who was very relatable because he'd grown up as a kid sidekick and the, his uncle had died and he'd taken up the mantle. And it was about becoming a man. And some of these, these really solid stories to, that are instructive to young men. And they were like, and here's a hip inner city black kid to replace him because he hasn't been in it. And everyone went, that's not our favourite character. And they went, that's because you're a racist. And I didn't have the the philosophical toolkit to explain why I was frustrated with that happening. But I knew in my gut it wasn't quite right. But I, I wasn't too involved in politics. <sighs> until I was in uni about 2017 when I realised I didn't particularly like a lot of the nonsense my classmates were espousing and so in private I was watching the SJW cringe compilations and all that sort of thing that was happening at the time and then in 2018 weirdly enough Cole came to our university campus and Sargon of Akkad had a lot of seaters for those who may not say off the top of their head and he caused quite the stink with the local Antifa and feminist chapters and the person who had invited him was Callum from Lotus Eaters, and he was in the student society. So yeah, we went to uni together. He was the, he was the year above. We, we didn't spend a lot of time together at that time, but but since all of the fallout with Carl's event and um, the student societies and student unions persecuting us for some edgy jokes, which got leaked from a group chat and saying, oh, well, the Nazis used humor to recruit their members. So you're there for a Nazi, which was insane and there were actual members of the student union involved in the Antifa group who were putting messages like um, let's bait them into being violent to shut them down so we went through all that debacle and, and Callum and I helped the actual society compile the evidence and, and say okay well this outside group that's trying to take down a student society which platformed the first Israeli and Palestinian ambassadors for a conversation on the UK university campus ever who, who raised thousands of pounds for anti-FGM charities. We did all this good work. Meanwhile, our opponents were graffitiing the sports centre with our name F us and, and crass things like that. Well, it turns out there was a, a conspiratorial cabal of other lecturers from other universities, local Antifa members and students all conspiring together to try and take us down. But we got nowhere because the student union was on their side. So, so after that was defunct, what ended up happening was some of our members splintered off and, and did various things. I know one person started Orthodox Conservatives group. One person got involved with the pro-life group in the UK. And then one of my friends, Chris Barnard, went on to start the British Conservation Alliance, which was modelled after the American Conservation Coalition in the US, which told the Republicans don't cede the grounds of the Green New Deal to the leftists because environmental policy is going to be the next frontier for economic prosperity and personal rights and also the americans given the republican bases are held up in the rural states they've got interests in hunting and farming and things like that so they have an easy in on saying well ecological policy is not just the the domain of the rabid leftists who want to dispense with coal and make us all poor and shiver to death so over here we turned around and said this is something that our government's going along with as is every government because i suppose it's a conspiracy theory to state that every government is pushing policies for 2030 almost like there's some kind of agenda there but there you go but of course the british countryside is an institution of our own making it's been generations of being tilled and shaped and and the woodlands that britain so famously has romantic poetry written about it wouldn't exist if it went for the industrial revolution because we were cutting down trees till the apex of about 1550 when wood prices were so expensive that many people couldn't eat and all it took was one genius to create coal rather than charcoal and then the whole world gets upgraded and, and suddenly we have forests rejuvenated but anyway so we, we thought we'd pitch all these arguments from a conservative perspective at least from the outset it, it mortars got muddied as, as presidents changed hands and the charity commission got involved as i'm sure you know there are 
bunch of lefties. And we thought we'd pitch our ideas for a more libertarian governance structure, but a conservative sentiment to the conservative government who weren't really doing either at that time. And this was before the 2019 election, even. And I got involved through that because I was doing a lot of volunteer writing. I was never paid for any of my work for BCA, by the way, just so anyone knows. And I did quite a few podcast appearances and, and things like that. It got to about 2021 when I took over as the policy head around 2020. So I de facto ran the policy department, even though I wasn't the head from when it started, but neither here nor there. I won't throw a shade on any former colleagues. And the Adam Smith Institute approached us to write a paper that they would then edit and promote to speak on three policies from the perspective of f privately funding it rather than the government just wasting taxpayer money on it. Because they saw it as an incremental step towards improving how the net zero policies had captured our economic system so and, and this is part of the reason why i've basically abandoned westminster politics is because i don't like this weird negotiation where it takes 10 months to 12 months to get a sort of paper out and then the government are going to ignore you and do what they did anyway but anyway so so the adam smith institute who i, I ended up writing a paper for a few months and then they ended up tripling the word count by all the revisions so by the time i got it out i was glad to be shot of it but i'm, I'm very glad i did it because of two reasons. One, it, it springboarded me into the wider policy sphere of Westminster. And, and I do think I brought that insider knowledge of how things work to low seaters, because as you said, having a political background means that you understand how, how power dynamics and just the interpersonal relations of how policies are passed and, and certain special interests get pushed through is a decent asset um, that may have been missing. And also it, it meant that I... I had like a bad taste in my mouth. I, I wasn't I wasn't particularly idealistic because even though they listened to one of my proposals in the paper, which was privately funding nuclear power stations so we didn't have to go to the Chinese or the French, um, one's less bad than the other, but only marginally, uh, for funding because otherwise, you know, it takes 10 years to build, so new tech, new specifications, the budget always outpaces what's originally done, so end up the taxpayer ends up being on the hook for it, and we hate that. Rather than doing that, the energy companies can foot the bill, and then we get cheap energy and they get a profit. That'd be a great idea. And they included that in the, in the nuclear financing bill of 2022, but then none of the other proposals were looked at. All of their other proposals for the other policies seemed to have such clear errors that I couldn't believe that hundreds of researchers, well-paid in Whitehall, far better paid than I was, hadn't spotted these problems. And so it just meant that I was disaffected enough to be not a neutral arbiter, but to, to scrutinize all of these things that are happening at the moment with, with a degree of cynicism that meant I could be a pretty effective, harsh critic. And so I went from from doing that for quite a while after after COP26, I was basically done with it, especially because, it, again, it felt like people were rather than questioning the presuppositions of the policy, were trying to minimize the amount of damage that was done by an agenda that already been set on and so i was freelance writing for a while doing my own opinion stuff doing movie reviews and policy reviews for american spectator going on talk and gb news I, I had a monday night show with kevin o'sullivan which was very good for quite a while um until a little blacklisting event from mike graham and then the entire um apparatus of the network changed hands and they re function their programming but neither here nor there 